I have a question for Professor Hoppe. So Professor Hoppe mentioned that decentralization should be um, the goal, and uh, Yosef also mentioned that earlier. Um, my question is, do you think this process of decentralization should occur in Europe? Because to me it seems that the current, that the greatest threat to European civilization at the moment is the American hegemony. And my view is that if Europe undergoes a process of political decentralization, then it will be unable to in a way, defend itself perhaps against the against the United States, not only militarily, but also culturally, socially, um, and this I think uh, would be a great, in a way, if 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 the United States, if you know, if Europe became weaker and the United States found some way to infiltrate Europe, that might not be the best word. It would be a disaster, an even greater disaster for um, European civilization. Uh, we saw after the fall of the Roman Empire, you know. It was, for 400 years, it was chaos, anarchy, with the Visigoths, the Swabians, um, other, you know, the other groups. And uh, I'm just curious whether you think this process of decentralization should occur in Europe now, whether now is the best um, time for this. Certainly in America, I understand, if there's internal instability and the union falls apart, I think that's a desirable thing for Europe and for other countries that have been abused by the American hegemony. But perhaps um, the the disintegration of you know the coalition of European states that exists now, although imperfect, is not the best um, is not the best strategy to pr pursue at at the current moment. I'm curious what you, yeah, what you think. I would be all in favor of the European countries breaking with the United States. The first step would be, of course, to leave NATO. Um, and um, I do not expect that the United States would would attack European countries uh, if they decide we will leave NATO. Um, I don't think they would have public support, sufficient public support in the United States for doing something something like this. I also hope that the European Union will break apart. The European Union currently is only kept alive in so far as some European countries, especially Germany, because Germany is of course the eternally guilty country until the end of all days, uh, and has to pay for its sins that it committed in, in the past until the world ends. If the payment of Germany to various countries would no longer come, these can, countries have no reasons to stay within the Union. You see diversions, for instance, already now, that Hungary is continuously punished, Poland is continuously punished for slightly different reasons um, by the European Union because they do not adhere to the high standards that are typical, let's say, of, of the, the most idiotic government in, German, in, in, in Europe, which is the German government. Um, if as soon as the payments would stop, there would be no reason for Poland to stay within the European Union. As soon as the payments would stop, there would be no reason for Hungary to stay within the European Union. Once it is, becomes established that it was the United States in cooperation with the Ukraines or Poles or whatever it was that blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, there will be a massive move in the population in these various countries to uh, disassociate themselves from from the United from the United States, um, and uh, that would be would encourage of us not only other countries leaving NATO. It was also that would affect the European Union in the same way. Because what the European Union does is it tries to eliminate competition between various regions in Europe. That's why they introduced something like the OECD introduced now a minimum tax put on all, uh, on all companies of at least 15%. 15 per, 15 um, even, even the Switzer, Switzerland, in Switzerland I always hailed as one of the great examples of uh, neutral countries. The Switzerland, in, in terms of idiocy, only lag a little bit behind the other European countries. So they agreed, for instance, also to accept this 15 percent minimum minimum tax. Uh, of course, if you if you are not part of the robbing gang of 
the gang leaders, yeah, you, you would have to strictly oppose something like that. It reduces the competitiveness of Switzerland as compared to other countries if they'd have to tax the same way. They have not reached a point where the taxes have been uniformed, uh, un are harmonized all through Europe. But that is, of course, what they are trying to do. Um, they want to make all countries equally poor instead of allowing some countries to flourish and other countries go down the drain. And I think it is good if some people go down the drain. Um, I also, to um, address a little bit the point that, um, that Joseph made when he said what Huerta de Soto was in favor of the European, of, of the EU. Let me say this, this is a nice thing to say from a Spaniard point of view, because Spain was one of these countries that had very high inflation rates and their currency continuously devalued. He was in favor of that because he thought joining with Germany and the Netherlands and those countries that pursued a more sober policy expanded their money supply less so than the Spaniards, they, they would be disciplined by this. But of course the exact opposite has happened if you look at the overall picture. There's in the, the heads of the, central, of the European central banks, there you have now a Spaniard, there you have a Greek, uh, there you have an Italian, uh, there you have a German, you have a Frenchman, you have, you're overwhelmed by highly inflationary countries and their functionaries determining now the policy uh, of, of, the European, of the European Central Bank. So my view on this, I disagree with Huerta, de, I agree with Huerta de Soto on many, many things, but I do not agree with him on that one. Um, it is the purpose of money to be the most easily saleable good of all goods. Um, that facilitate, facilitate trade um, and reduces transaction cost to the, to the utmost. But this, unif this one currency that exists must be out of the hands of government and this is precisely what the gold standard did. The gold standard was destroyed by governments beca because uh, it did not allow them to inflate uh, as, it, as they like to inflate. If you have fiat currencies, then I think competition is good because it forces countries that are more inflationary to look at countries that are less inflationary and they have to, they have to reduce their willingness to print more, more money because they know people will go from currencies that are more inflationary to currencies that are less inflationary. So under fiat currents, under fiat money regimes, it is good to have competition between different currencies. But that is in a way contradictory to the idea of a money. So you are in a system of partial barter. I think Rahi mentioned that briefly because he quoted me. Uh, that, um, uh, but you want government out of it. If it is in there, then competition is indeed uh, a good thing because it curtails the power of each individual central bank to do whatever whatever they they please uh, please to do. So I'm. I'm worried. I said more than I, than I, I said. I, I don't want to monopolize this. You, you, you want to? I'm not sure the rest of us need to be up here. Um, but I, I, I'm probably saying that too early. But uh, in, the, in the form of your question, you said after the Roman Empire collapsed that anarchy broke out. Isn't that what you said? Isn't that what we're after? For anarchy to break out. Well, by anarchy, I mean regions that were defenseless, that had no way of, there, there was no coalition of, you can call it states or whatever, no coalition of polities that was you know, capable of defending, you know, defending itself against foreign invaders. It was mostly the Visigoths, the Swabians, and the Ostrogoths, the Franks, um, these groups that were 
very fragmented. Uh, yeah, my question was if this happens in Europe now, then it would be, it would render you very vulnerable to the United States, which at the moment is becoming stronger and stronger despite all of the internal instabilities. So an anarchy might break out again, and, and that would be a bad thing? For Europe. Okay. So you are on record, as opposed to the rest of this crowd, <laughs> that anarchy breaking out would be a bad thing. All right. I consider myself evil. Okay. Sorry. Do you have a comment on that, Professor? Anybody else who wants to do <laughs> Try it? <laughs> no, as I, as I said, you see, look, you have, to, you have to also see what the, what the American army looks like in the meantime. It's like the, the, Amer the American army, the, they, they, are, they let the Ukrainians do the fighting for a reason. Um, because the American army is just a laughing stock. They, are, uh, they, have, they have great military equipment, but, be, but, but, in, but in terms of the personnel that they have, I, I think, uh, you know, the affirmative action has taken over the American army too. Um, they, they also have uh, tanks that, uh, that can be m manned by pregnant women and uh, t take, m make sure uh, that, that, that they are able to just, uh, oper operate tanks despite all the problems that women as compared to men have when it comes to things like this. So, no, I, th I think the American army will not attack the European countries. F after all this, there are also mighty European countries like France also have atomic weapons. Um, and the, the French people I certainly would certainly resist an invasion of the Americans. Um, and there might be other, and I think Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein would also resist uh, an invasion of the Americans. And you have to have public opinion in your favor. There's, there's no public opinion in, in the United States in favor of occupying European countries. Uh, this question is mostly for Professor Hoppe. Uh, so you've made what many of us perceive as a lot of very important contributions to libertarianism such as argumentation ethics, uh, Austrian class analysis, the critique of democracy, contributions that have helped bring people to libertarianism and helped libertarians get, libertarian, get libertarianism right, so to speak. Um, Kinsella has also brought about his contributions in IP, and of course, before you, Rothbard and Mises brought about their contributions. So going forward with the next generation, are there any areas that you would love to see new contributions in, areas that might be underdeveloped in libertarianism, where you would love to see uh, new ideas come about and see libertarianism brought forward to the future? I think Stefan Kinsella has brought libertarianism uh, ahead quite, quite a bit. Uh, if you read my preface to his big book, I, I hail him uh, as being the, the, the most important legal theorist of his, of his generation. Um, you will find a tremendous wealth of additional things in, in his big fat book. And, and, and as, said, as you uh, heard before, there, there are many, many big fat books uh, come, coming along in the next, uh, in the next few years. Uh, if he holds up his promise. Stefan, can you say something about this? <laughs> uh, I have thought about this before, about what, what fields need to be developed. Uh, most of the ones I have in mind are fairly esoteric. Um, a lot of them are pragmatic, like strategy, because strategy, we've tried so many strategies over the years. Um, and by the way, Someone told me they misunderstood my com my new IP book will not be a thousand pages. It's probably a hundred pages, so it will be a nice slim synthesis. But uh, no, uh, um, that may be something to write about, like areas for future research to give people the uh, you know suggestions for what they could work on next. But um, um, I, I'm about out myself. <laughs> and I think there's. There is nothing wrong. Look, in, I think in, in mathematics, you also have very slow progress, if at all. 
um, in disciplines like logic. You, you have very slow progress, if any at all. Uh, there are some, some disciplines different than other disciplines. In the natural sciences, there might be continuous progress taking place. In medicine, I hope there will be major progress taking place. Uh, as far as economics is concerned, I, I think there is not much beyond what Mises and Rothbard have done that can be done. Uh, we should be just happy that we still know what they have written, that we can just recapitulate it ourselves, that we preserve the culture, uh, uh, the, 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 our, our culture and our knowledge that we have uh, is sometimes the only thing that we can do. Uh, and we should be happy that those things are not simply forgotten. The ruling elites want us to just not read these books, not learn these things. We have, every generation has to relearn also a large amount of things from pre people who lived before them. And as, uh, uh, as we heard from the IQ talk, um, this is even more important now as the I general IQ is going down. The few people who still have a high IQ are even, have even a greater responsibility now to make sure that those things that already exist will not be forgotten and unlearned, uh, but, kept, but kept alive. Um, if somebody comes up with something great, I would be surprised, but I've seen at Mises Institute conferences where sometimes people are, I do something new. I thought that was, I laughed about it. I didn't see that there was anything new. It was just new confusion that they spread. Uh, so learn what is there and recapitulate it and, uh, and spread these things to other people. Don't always strive for innovation that happens once in a while that somebody innovates something in these disciplines. I mean, there are disciplines where there are innovations from taking place from day to day, but not in logic, not in mathematics, not in praxeology. There are very minor refinements that can take place, but not much more. Yeah. Uh, they say in finance that uh, uh, knowledge is, is not cumulative, it's cyclical. And that gets proved over and over again as we uh, go through one boom and, and bust after another. And uh, I would say for, for Austrians in the crowd that are interested in finance, uh, Murray Rothbard uh, wrote a wonderful book called The Mystery of Banking. Uh, but at this stage, uh, that needs to be uh, expanded upon considerably to take into account the shadow bank, uh, the expansion of the Fed, um, the expansion of, of the Treasury, and the various programs that have been layered one on top of the other. Because as these, uh, as these programs get instituted in each subsequent emergency, they never go away. So, um, you know, Murray's book, while very valuable, uh, another of his books is uh, What Has the Government Done to Our Money? or In Defense of the 100% Gold Dollar. Uh, again, very valuable and something that students would never be taught anywhere else. Uh, but uh, a, a, a book on the entire system, how it works, um, and uh, the exponential growth of uh, the Federal Reserve and its uh, powers and uh, influences is, uh, is what should be done. And I would, I would hope that it would be done by some student at the Mises Institute or somewhere else, but uh, that, is, uh, that is sorely needed in, uh, in terms of being shored up. Okay, uh, should, should I go first? Or? 
Or, yeah. So, so yeah, my question is for uh, Oliver Richard. And uh, so I saw that in, in your references that you had uh, Ed, uh, Edward Dutton a lot in the, yeah, in the references. And he has a you know, very jolly uh, pod, uh, like YouTube channel which goes into details on uh, IQ. And what he actually proposes is that IQ didn't peak just a few decades ago, but that it actually peaked in the uh, late 1800s. Uh, and his, uh, the data that he uh, provides for this is not just IQ tests, but also other pieces of data, such as uh, like major per capita uh, innovations, um, like reaction times, which were measured uh, back then, which also strongly correlate uh, with, with IQ, and the usage of uh, complicated words in text. And if you analyze this, then uh, the, um, the IQ roughly peaked uh, around uh, 1880 or something like that, uh, which is much, much earlier than um, what you have presented. Now, the rationale pr provided there, how, how this could possibly be, is that uh, IQ tests oversample the uh, part of IQ which can be uh, taught. So one example that is, that is brought is that, uh, for example, the statement, uh, there are no camels in Germany, Berlin is in Germany, um, and then the question, does Berlin have any camels? Many people from 100 years ago would, uh, would answer, uh, I've never been in Berlin, I don't know if there are any camels, even though they had uh, these three chain of arguments. Now in school, this is you know, very easily uh, you know, like you learn these uh, logical chains very easily. Um, so do you agree with his assessment uh, with a very different timeline regarding uh, IQ decline? Or uh, do you think there's a, uh, a flaw in, in, in that reasoning? Well, I, I, I'm not familiar with his channel. I mean, obviously I'm familiar with his name, but only in so far that he co-authored many papers with Richard Lynn, which then I had to read in order to put the presentation together, especially on the sort of anti-Flynn kind of side of things. Um, Richard actually uh, was in this uh, sort of conversation with uh, James Flynn about how to name the Flynn effect, and I somewhat quickly said that uh, Richard had written an 82 paper uh, that should have really given him the name, but Richard was a very modest man. So what he did is he looked at all the people prior to 1982 who had observed what we now call the Flynn effect, that is a rise in IQ. And I think the first one he got was uh, from 1930. So I don't remember exactly, I didn't include it in my study, uh, but uh, let's assume the sample size is you know, maybe until World War I. So I think there's considerable evidence that after the IQ was invented in 1905, after it was adapted to English by uh, Louis Sturman at Stanford, 1916, from then onwards, all the revisions have been upwards f from that point onwards. Uh, but I do agree with you that, or with Edward Dutton, that there are correlates to IQ uh, reaction time is definitely a good one. Uh, another one which may or may not be feasible is the uh, <clears throat> sort of size of the brain. And for that you need three-dimensional uh, tomography or whatever it's called, because you can't just sort of measure the circumference because the brain is uh, shaped in a very strange way. Well, the, the skull is shaped in a very strange way. So it's possible. Um, my gut instinct, I would say, uh, in the absence of better data and suddenly in the absence of having seen the videos that you're referring to, uh, would be that uh, possibly the smart fraction in 1880 was very intelligent. And then uh, a lot of the people who were not intelligent, who were sort of drawing down the average, uh, were malnourished, essentially, so the, the poor. Uh, so that would probably explain um, what I know, because I've read things written by people in the 1880s, I've seen the tests, they had Oxford, Cambridge, and they're extremely impressive. So maybe that's the way I would reconcile, but I cannot really say much more uh, given the fact that the IQ was only invented in 1905. Hi, actually my question is to all the speakers. Of course, I might be mistaken in my observations, but if I look at 
the United States continent or the European continent, what I see currently is a great economic mayhem that they won't be able to clean up that easily. Bef between green communism, the socialism, the drugs, inept governments, currently everybody out there, even like the normal Joe, is able to see something has gone wrong. There is something wrong that every day his shopping basket is costing him more while he doesn't have more. The systems are going down the healthcare and everything. So something has gone wrong. But there is no mention of libertarianism or the Austrian economics even as a viable alternative. I mean, people look at, they, a lot of people feel this is wrong, but when you say, what is the solution? There, there's so many, so little people are exposed. Even in some of the top Ivy universities, when you say you're a libertarian, they're like, oh, you believe in that fringe economic theory. So what do you think can be done, or by Mises Institute, or by other people like us, that we get this as a possible alternative, like to everyone. Everybody band about in the end, I believe, is logical about their own pocket. So if you get, okay, this is what's been wrong, and here, look, there is a theory, this might get your pocket to be better, I think at least the exposure would increase. All of education has been essentially taken over by the state. That also applies to the private universities. The private universities are almost as much dependent on the state as the state universities. All their research grants and so forth are governmental grants. And the government, the state, realizes that the Austrian school is their main enemy. They have to be destroyed. Look, Mises did not acquire a paying job at the United States at any elite university. He had to be paid by outside supporters. Um, even though at that time, at least as far as Europe was concerned, he was one of the most famous economists. And people now, many people agree that he was the greatest economist ever. He could not get a paying job in the United States. Even Hayek, who is a moderate guy, a very moderate, I mean, uh, he, he could live with a f Swedish welfare state. Um, even Hayek could got, get not a paying job in the United States. The University of Chicago had to be paid by the same group of businessmen who also paid Ludwig von Mises' salary. Uh, and he returned from the United States back to Germany because the University of Chicago uh, refused to pay him a pension. And because he knew Ludwig Erhard in Germany, as some sort of friend, and Ludwig, von e Ludwig Erhard at that time was either chancellor or uh, uh, economics, economics minister, he finagled f for him to get a job at the University of Freiburg, even though he had already passed the age when you can make somebody a Beamte, uh, that is a tenured person in, in Germany. Murray Rosbart, with whom I was very close, as far as I'm concerned, he is the brightest man I ever met in my life. The guy was smarter than all Harvard and Yale faculty put together. He couldn't get a job at any major university. At the end of his life, by luck, he ended up with some sort of endowed chair at the lowest salary at the University of Nevada, and I was happy enough to be taken with, he took, took me with him and managed, finagled that I would have got, get a job there uh, at, the same, at the same university. None, none of the Austrian economists, especially not the outspoken ones, have any chance to ever land a big job at any leading, so-called leading university in the United States or in any other Western country. 
by, I think, Guido also by accident, uh, by the fact that a, a strange, some strange events have had, had happened that the, the committee that selected professors for French universities, for one year it was possible for him to get a job. Uh, I doubt that accidents like that will happen very frequently. Guido, if, if that was not right, what I said, simply just protest. Uh, he, Guido is one of the only, only people, or one of the very few people whose protests I would take seriously. But I, but I think I was right in what I said. Yeah. Um, so you, the quick answer is, no, they don't want us. They consider us to be their enemy, and, they, and nobody gives us any, any money. Okay, uh, I, I have uh, three quick questions for Doug. What are your three favorite financial newsletters? For um, uh, Olivier, uh, do you know, are you aware of any studies that examine the impact of the dissolution of the family on IQ development? And Stefan, are you aware of any other area in law that should not exist, such as IP law? Thank you. So uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not Richard Lynn, so uh, he would know. No, I, I only know the papers I read you know, in preparation for this. There wasn't really much talk about that. Um, I think that uh, uh, there's definitely a, a clear case for um, cognitively demanding intellectual stimulation of the children to be positively correlated with their ability to realize 100% of their IQ genetic potential. And as I said, IQ is 80% heritable in, from age 18 onwards. So it looks to me a broken family would probably not really fulfill that very much because then the kid is just going to be playing on their iPhone the whole day, but that's the only correlation I can see with the literature I've read. Okay, yeah, well there's lots of areas of law that shouldn't exist because there's types of laws that shouldn't exist and uh, maybe the first one which is interesting to me would be antitrust law or competition law as it's called in Europe. Um, of course, that's all invalid as well. Um, administrative law would not exist if not for a huge bureaucratic state. Um, but maybe more controversially, from a more theoretical point of view, I sometimes think maybe criminal law should not exist, and it should, everything should be resti restitution-based. But it would be based upon criminal law principles, but it would be sort of restitution-based instead of uh, retributive and impunitive. But that's a deeper, a deeper topic. So it was my three favorite? Yes. So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, my favorite uh, by far, and I am a paid-up subscriber uh, to Grant's Interest Rate Observer, uh, which has been in business for 40 years, and uh, the uh, writer, primary writer and uh, proprietor is uh, James Grant. And if you haven't read James Grant, he has many books and a uh, big fan of the Austrian school. Uh, it's probably in every other newsletter. He mentions uh, uh, Austrian work in one way or another. It's expensive, uh, I will tell you that, but uh, it's, uh, you know, and the, it, he's not as big on actionable ideas and hyperbolic sort of uh, uh, pronouncements. A lot of it is economic history. So if, uh, if you have the time and uh, you're interested in just great uh, financial writing, uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer is, is a wonderful, wonderful publication. Um, secondly, I also subscribe to what I consider a financial newsletter, even though it is uh, they are videos online, and uh, uh, it's called Real Vision. Uh, Real Vision is uh, what it it follows the same format. 
It has a free daily that you can get either uh, uh, on uh, X, as it's called now, or you can sign up for it. And so you get uh, uh, in long form, you know, 30 minutes uh, interviews that are that are quite insightful by, by people people who are outside the CNBC uh, typical financial um, framework. Uh, then they have a next step, which is called the essential step, and I forgot what they're charging for that. And then beyond that, you've, if you really want to, you know, dive deep into this stuff, then they have other, uh, a next level. So it's, it's set up just like a financial newsletter. Uh, Raul Powell is uh, the proprietor of this. Uh, he uh, lives very nicely in the Caymans, it sounds like. Um, but uh, I find it very useful uh, because it gives a, a variety of... Uh, points of view and uh, uh, makes me think even 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 though I'm listening to somebody that I don't necessarily agree with uh, you know sometimes uh, Kane said this that uh, at some point you you don't uh, judge the merits of of individual securities you try to guess uh, what the public is going to do next and uh, so from, from that kind of uh, newsletter from Real Vision, uh, and I would, you, again, you can give it a try for free. I would recommend trying to do that. I struggled to find a third because it falls off uh, very quickly, but uh, there probably are others out there. Uh, I know people who, uh, until his recent death, uh, were uh, dedicated subscribers to Gary North, uh, and uh, who who a few of us know, and uh, they were very uh, very happy with his work. But uh, those are the two that I can think of. And, and as far as general advice is concerned, uh, somebody. Uh, like Doug Casey is of course uh, useful, but but there is not so much direct uh, financial advice, but simply making you aware of the dangers of the world and how you can protect yourself against those dangers. But he thinks along the same lines that that we think. Uh, I I had him here a number of years ago too, um, so. I, he has his website, International Men, I, I think it is called, um, that is useful to read, but not if, if you think I will become now rich and uh, follow his, his, uh, his advice. He, he advises you just if you, uh, whatever, want to protect yourself from inflation, uh, investment in gold and gold mines might be a good idea and things of that nature very useful but not directly useful in uh, on your way to become a multimillionaire i would say uh, my question was going to be the same as this gentleman's question over here on on IQ and when it peaked and and so all I would add to that is that the Ed Dutton stuff is very interesting and I find it very persuasive. I'm convinced Olivier only said that it peaked in 1992 because a lot of people in this room would have been going through school in 1992 and could go home thinking we're the brightest generation that's ever existed or will exist. The only additional thing to say is that the name of Ed Dutton's website could be applied to all of us in this room. He calls himself the Jolly Heretic, which I think we could all do the same. That's all. Thank you. Had a short question for Doug. I was curious if you're going to have a third part of your series and what it might be about. And then a longer question for uh, Dr. Richard. Uh, Professor Richard, in your presentation, you showed a graph and talked about four different forces on IQ. One of them, one of the positive forces was nutrition. And you said that really is only uh, growing uh, better in the uh, developing world right now. And then you also said one of the negative forces was an influx of immigrants from 
the developing world. And so I'm wondering, that graph that you showed where it goes down, don't you think it might actually flatten or go up again as those migrants that are coming in are not going to be as stupid in the future? Well, I think uh, what Richard would say to that, sorry, what Richard would say to that is that uh, even if the whole third world is super well nourished and every kid has to be stimulated intellectually at school until age 18 or homeschooled until age 18. Even then, at that point, they only achieve 100% of their genetic abilities uh, for intellectual quotient. And that is lower than the eight countries that I cited. Um, so the, the basic example is the uh, blacks in Africa uh, have tested at lower IQs than the blacks in the US because blacks in the US, they are forced to go to school until 18 and they are well fed. So nonetheless, there is still a gap between the whites and the blacks in the US in terms of average IQ. And that was the whole point of the first book I cited, The Bell Curve by Hernstein and Murray, which obviously was very controversial, but the data you know, is uh, a bit overwhelming. Uh, it's very hard to, to contradict. So I think that um, it's, it's going to help a little bit, but not enough. There, there, there's still a limit to how much they can catch up with us. Did you have a question for me? What was it? Uh, you were going to have a third party series, and what it might be about. Uh, what? The third part of the racket series, like you did one on nonprofits and then one on these letters. Well, uh, you know, the uh, our, our host, our gracious host here, has not signed on to this yet. But uh, yes, I, I do have a third part of. Uh, uh, I have something planned. It's already written, and it would. Uh, and I would just, I'll tell you what it is. It's the uh, 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 the uh, entrepreneurship, uh, academic entrepreneurship. Uh, racket of teaching entrepreneurship, uh, which, or as I might call it, teaching the unteachable. And uh, so I've I've done the I've done the work already. I've done the paper. And uh, yes, if there is a interest in hearing about that, I know that there are plenty of Austrians, uh, friends of ours, who are making a handsome living at various. Uh, uh, U.S. universities, but virtually every U.S. university uh, is now adding an entrepreneurship program uh, because uh, uh, young people, uh, they want to be, they view entrepreneurship as being rich. So uh, they want to be rich, they want to own their own company, and uh, they believe that's something you can sit in a classroom and learn. and. Uh, History certainly defies that. So yes, that would be the that would be the third leg uh, to the uh, racket series uh, if there is an interest in uh, anyone wanting to hear it. Yeah, to these to these people, I would also say, if you are so smart, why ain't you rich? Um, no, entrepreneurship cannot be taught. Uh, the only thing that economists can do for economists, for entrepreneurs, is to, uh, to help them avoid absolutely stupid mistakes. Uh, but that's that's the most that they can do. Um, if you see the money supply going up all up, all over and constantly, and then people expect that prices will fall next year, then obviously they are making a big mistake. But but those are the only things that we can tell them. Uh, and uh, there are many successful entrepreneurs who are dumb when it comes, they would not pass a microeconomic class with myself. Uh, but nonetheless, they are far richer than I am. Uh, obviously, they have skills that I, that I don't have. And you cannot teach these sorts of skills. 
if you could teach them, then you could not even explain in a way why there are successful people and why they are unsuccessful people. Because then there would be some sort of algorithm that the, that's the only thing that you have to follow and then you will be a successful man. I don't know anything about these artificial intelligence things so far, but some people think that artificial intelligence will allow us to make successful predictions in terms of the stock market and so forth. I think that is also all nonsense. Uh, if that would be really the case, then all people would use the same sort of uh, artificial intelligence and make the same forecast. But but if all make people make the same forecast, then this these people will not be rich because all buy the same stocks. Uh, so artificial intelligence will not help us. They help us to do certain routine things uh, more easily. I think judges will have difficulties keeping their, jo their job in the same number because artificial intelligence will tell them all the judgments that were made in similar cases. Uh, people will write fund, fund, uh, fund le raising letters or something like that. There exist probably thousands of fund raising letters and artificial intelligence will write a nice letter, uh, to, to tell people why they have to donate for this, for this or that instead of employing just, uh, deep thinkers to write these uh, fundraising letters. Artificial intelligence can probably just turn them out in a minute in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 for, for any type of purpose for which you want to raise funds. But entrepreneurship cannot be taught. Um, so I have uh, some statements to make uh, in response to uh, Doug as well as uh, Dr. Hopper's uh, comment on Doug Casey. I, I try to defend the indefensible regarding a uh, new setter because I'm currently a, a writer uh, in a financial column. So I don't, th I don't know whether I should be classified as you know, those uh, new setter producer. And uh, yeah, I, in a way, maybe I'm also a, you know, selling stick oil. Uh, but um, uh, personally, I write financial uh, newspaper column not because I want to teach people how to rich, because firstly, I'm not rich, so I cannot teach people how to be rich. But before I write the financial newspaper, uh, I, I ran a, a think tank uh, with Nick for a period of time. So I tried to get donation from donors, and I offer the material basically for free regarding free market teaching. But from my point of view, it didn't work very well. It's free material, and you know, people that just, not many people care. But as soon as I put something financial on what I'm saying, basically the same thing, but I just changed the terms with different marketing, people listen to me. I have no intention of making them rich. And because I think this is not teachable. And I, I would like, of course, I need to say something. Oh, um, this company, well, based, based on my knowledge in economics, I think this company run very well. I don't give uh, the timing of when you should buy. I don't give uh, the entry price. I wouldn't give at what price you should sell. I just say, oh, this is a good company because they run it this way. I would love to own the share, uh, you know, but if you can make money or not, I, I, I have no guarantee. But as soon as you put money in those things, all of a sudden, in the past, I need to get the money from the donors over the material for free, but soon I change the clothes, people pay me to say the same thing. So I don't know the other you know, people in the new sector industry. Maybe they just want to make money. Maybe they just want to sell snake oil. But, but for me, well, I don't know that. But is it just a marketing technique to draw eyeballs? Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and regarding whether people can be taught 
on making money. No, my conclusion is after like 10, more than 10 years writing, and I meet the, my reader face to face. If, if they're intelligent, they will make money. Even the same advice, same suggestion you give to different people, some people make money, some people lose money. So again, like, I don't think investment is uh, teachable. That, that, yeah, well, I'm just saying maybe that he has a good heart. Like maybe he has no intention of making people uh, uh, millionaires. But if you, if you didn't say that, people don't listen to you. So well, in a way, maybe we are, you know, selling, oh, we, we are selling dreams. But if I don't sell dreams, people don't listen to us. Um, well, I don't know. I, I'm just saying that may you know, maybe he has a good heart of how uh, that Casey, that Casey, how he market his material. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, basically, we agree on this, right? I mean, uh, it is. Uh, it, I, I give financial advice sometimes too. I'm just saying, I think that might be a good idea or that might be, be a good, that, that one. No, no, I don't think I would touch that. Uh, everybody does it. Uh, I think Joseph is in that business also, right? You give advice, <laughs> say something. <laughs> We're going to take other questions, I believe. We still uh, have time, right? Do we still have time? Here still, we have time. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, Joseph, I'm glad you have the microphone because which year and number of the Playboy I have to buy to read the article? Oh, yeah, good, good question. <laughs> Send me an email, I'll scan it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on the IQ, I just wanted to make one like little premise. Maybe you can agree or disagree, but. Um, so we, 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 you're talking about means in IQ, right? It's just averages over a population. Um, it doesn't really matter whether it goes up or down, because as you said, it was a reflection of, um, of migration, um, nutrition, and education, and, and so forth. But what's, I, you know, as long as smart males meet up with smart females, um, smart people will still exist unless, you know, unless you're going to have, you know, smart males starting to um, procreate with, you know, low intelligent women uh, making the, or, you know, making much more average and then that would be a problem. But as long as we keep, uh, I mean, not we, it's not, it's not, it's not so, <laughs> so that's just all, I, all, I was gonna, all, all I'm saying is that I'm not really afraid with seeing these these curves, okay, the migration, uh, as long as, you know, th these low IQ people have uh, children and, and, and then we have us high IQ people <laughs> maybe have uh, also children, then, then I don't see that as a, as a, as a problem. Um, that was my first premise. <laughs> maybe I have another one. Um, or maybe you, you can to answer in sequence, perhaps. So let's start with the first one. So basically the question is not whether smart people will still exist. It's a bell curve. Mm -hmm. So literally, if you go on the, on the right tail, you're, you're going to have some people there. The question is how many? And uh, that, that is kind of the problem because there is, you, you mentioned three factors uh, in, in your question. And there was a fourth factor, which I mentioned, which was called dysgenic fertility. And there's ample evidence that uh, the smart men who marry smart women, they have fewer children than the dumb men who marry dumb women. So then that means that this sort of right tail of the bell curve is getting thinner. And that is a bit of a problem. Um, if you extrapolate to uh, the, the, the mean, uh, so that was to answer your question, but if the mean goes down sufficiently, uh, the first thing to break down will be indoor plumbing. You won't be able to flush your toilet. Just because the infrastructure needed to do that has a lot of engineers and qualified people in the middle of the bell curve to keep it running. So, you know, you may need a big garden to um, <clears throat> go to um, the toilets. Okay, well, thank you. 
as a criticism of uh, uh, Richard Lynn's book, uh, uh, IQ and the Wealth of Nations, uh, some people, it was not so much a criticism, but more that uh, he did not emphasize enough uh, that it is m even more important is a smart f fraction of the population that must exist in order for a country to develop. Um, and if there's small, fr I think people, I have not personally studied this, I only read some of these things. Um, they say you at least ha have to have 15% of the population that have to be well above 115 uh, or something like that. That, that is what you, is absolutely necessary in order to have some sort of developing uh, developing country going on, even if the rest of the population is rather uh, lousy. But of course, what uh, uh, Olivier just uh, uh, mentioned, you, you know, there is division of labor in in society and in developed countries. There is a huge division of labor. Uh, even if the smartest people would have to do plumbing and they have not been trained to do plumbing, uh, even brain surgeons might not be able to fix uh, the, the, the plumbing defect um, that uh, has occurred. So you need these people too in order to make it possible for the very smart ones to do their very smart work that they do. Every person can somehow participate in the division of labor. Even people with very low skills are useful for certain, for certain activities. What the welfare state does, however, is ruin even those people that do menial, menial work by allowing them not even to get a training in these menial activities that are just as important for a comfortable life than some of the top achievements that some of the top people do. Uh, just, just see at your home if the water pipes break and your, and your house is getting flooded, what you do in, in such a case. Uh, you need certain people that are maybe not the brightest people, but what they do to society is very important. Everyone has a place in society, uh, and we should just avoid that people can linger around, do absolutely nothing, and being paid for this. This is, this is of course, what the welfare state does. I mean, the, the point that, um, that you made that, that smart, smart people have less kids and dumb people have more kids is of course promoted by the welfare state. Uh, you, you, get pay, you get paid for doing nothing and producing kids. Um, so if you do that, yes, that will end in disaster. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have a second premise for uh, Dr. Kinsella, um, <clears throat> but I, I will start by introducing it by say, say, um, coming back on something that Professor Hoppe said um, on Texas. <clears throat> so uh, my premise is that there's always multiple arguments uh, to, to make a point. Um, for Texas, you could say, for example, about well, Texas, uh, especially income tax, is basically um, disincentivizing working. Right, uh, that's an argument, but you know the other argument is like taxes are basically theft, and that's a moral argument. Now, um, and I would say, well, you know, even if taxes were somehow, in some way, positive, um, the moral argument of that the taxes are, you know, in uh, in, in in violation of, uh, you know, property rights is trumps all other um, other arguments that may exist. And so for um, Dr. Kinsella's argument against intellectual property, um, you know, I, I haven't read your book yet, but I, I mean, everybody says it's very thick. So <laughs> um, I read your first book, uh, which was very thin. <laughs> and um, so 
the, the main gist of it is that intellectual property, I mean, at least in my, in my understanding, was just basically immoral because it goes against the rights of everyone to use an ID, which has, uh, doesn't harm anyone, so it's within your right to do so. And so all other arguments, maybe that's why the book is thick, because you have a thousand other arguments, but do they really matter when that what first argument, you know, is, the, is almost the most important one or the only important one? No, yeah, I get it. Um, well, it's one reason, so uh, uh, I focus primarily on the, on the rights issue, which you, you're calling moral. Um, yeah, fundamentally, you have the right to do anything as long as you're not using someone else's resource without their permission. So once you recognize, this is why I mentioned that one of the three property rules is rectification. If you commit a tort or aggression, then you might owe someone some money. But fundamentally, by using an idea that I got from the public, uh, that was publicly available somehow, like if someone sells a new, a new car or a new invention that has a, a unique idea in it, and I see that, th this guy is giving me the, uh, the information. So if I use that information, I am not trespassing against his resources. I'm, the, I'm not going into his factory. I'm not going into his home. I'm not breaking into his computer. And so I've not committed a tort. So there's no, there's no justification to take property from me. Now, the taxation thing, I think Rothbard has this classification um, schema. I think you would call that uh, either autarkic or b binary uh, intervention, where the, the government just takes money from you by coercing you to pay it for taxes. But in the patent case, it's more of a triangular intervention, where they're basically letting one of their subjects take money from another one of their subjects. And, they, and then they get a cut from patent office fees and things like that. But yeah, so it, it, when, in, in the past, when I have countered the or utilitarian arguments by pointing out that even by your own logic, by the utilitarian logic that patents benefit society, I don't accept that's the standard anyway. And people criticize me for even answering them because they say I'm buying into utilitarianism. And I said, well, I'm just trying to tell them that they're wrong even on their own terms. But even if they were right on their own terms, I would still oppose patents. So you're right. I think we have reached the time to stop. Thank you.